Welcome back to the uh, MMA Museum Podcast. I'm Miguel Dorati, and we have another great MMA guest. And uh, we've got Dan Hornbuckle, a Midwest legend, so to speak, a guy that came up in the 2000s, really, uh, in MMA before, uh, you know, 2007, 2008. He was already on the scene making noise, and uh, he's still making noise. He won a fight this last weekend, so I'm very happy to have uh, an old friend, Dan Hornbuckle. Dan, how are you? I'm doing very good, Miguel. How are you doing? Good, man. Nice to see you. And, uh, I'm glad you're doing well. Let's start from the very beginning, because there's some things I don't know about you, you know? So we'll, we'll, we'll start mm -hmm. there. Uh, you were born in the Midwest. I think you, you have uh, Native American in your background. So uh, describe growing up and how that puts you onto a path to be a martial artist, basically. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a member of the Eastern Band Cherokee. And, you know, growing up in the Midwest, being, you know, at the time, like the only Native American kid around, you know, I got picked on quite a bit. But uh, I had three older brothers that picked on me, too. So I I'm used to it. I'm not going to back down from nothing. And uh, I mean, the rest is the rest is it really just growing up tough underneath that. I got three older brothers and a younger sister, younger brothers. So there's six kids always fighting in a household is pretty much what we grew up doing. Um, Did and, you graduate, uh, uh, gravitate towards sports at all in, in school and stuff or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had uh, a very successful high school uh, football team. We went on to the final four. Um, I played varsity three out of the four years for football. Uh, I lettered all four years for wrestling in high school. And that's pretty much all I had time for was wrestling and football. Okay. So you came with a wrestling background. So a, yeah. a lot of the times, you know, when people come with a big show on the smaller shows, people are like, can you back it up? But you, you felt comfortable with your wrestling background heading into MMA. How, how'd you do the crossover? What, what led you to actually fist fight, you know? Yeah, it, I mean, I think we both know him, and a lot of people know him. His name's Kyle Watson. Okay, yeah, for sure. And and he was working at Menards. He and I worked at the same Menards location, and he come into, uh, the, uh, into work, and he had, had a black eye, and his arm was in a sling, and he had just had an MMA fight that weekend. And I looked at him, you know, he's real Abercrombie and Fitch pretty, right? Like, he do, he he belongs on a poster. And I was like, there's no way your pretty boy ass is in there MMA fighting. Like, that's that's reserved for tough guys. He's like, no, I'm serious. I do. So he, he invited me to come train with him. And it was just mats in a racquetball court. And it was Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So we started Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and then we started doing uh, – then we would – so that was in Champagne with Jack McBicker. And then we would travel to Bloom or to Peoria and train, started training Muay Thai with Ryan Blackerby. So we were doing that two or three times a week. And that was the beginning. And I was like, I'm ready to fight, you know, after a couple of months of training. And they're like, no, 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 no. It was uh, Kyle Watson, Jeff Serafin, and uh, Dr. Arif, who all fought on the Total Fight Challenge up in Chicago Hammond area on joe goitia's show you know every legend has gone through there if you know and i know we'll get to it here in a little bit but every legend that's ever fought out of the midwest has fought on the total fight challenge and they fought on the hook and shoot and if you didn't fight on those two shows in the midwest at the time nobody fucking knew who you were and yeah. after after those two shows then you went on to the big shit like those were the big stages that catapulted you to the next level and that's where I got my start was on the Total Fight Challenge because of those guys. And that, now, you know, you Kyle Watson, obviously a a, a tested veteran. You know, uh, Jack McVicker, you know, is basically a lifelong martial artist. You know, you ran into good people early. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I was I've I've been very blessed in my career to be guided and side by side with some of the best martial artists in the sport. So let's talk about that. So by the you, the Total Fight Challenge, Joe Gautier show out of Chicago, uh, by the time they did TFC five, now you were you were on that card. You you fought your uh, your debut fight there. What do you remember about that day? Uh, <laughs> the handler was born. <laughs> I I hated Great my nickname. nickname. <laughs> I hated it. 
I hated it when I first started. They were like, oh, you're going to manhandle people. You're going to go out there and handle their balls. You're the handler. I'm like, I hated it. And uh, went out there and TKO'd my opponent. Like, I literally went out there and manhandled him. Body slammed him. Mike Bosniak was my first opponent. Yep. And uh, he was uh, he was 0-0 just like myself. And it was great. It was a great fight. And the handler was born, and I embraced it. And I was like, this shit is fun and let's get going and then okay. never look back never look back how much how much did you get paid for that for this first adventure there it was like 300 bucks okay yeah 300 bucks that's uh, that's pretty good for that day those day and age yeah for that for the starting right out of the gate that wasn't too bad at all and uh you're talking about february 18 2006 so we have a point of reference after that you do a, a series of fights for the TFC. Uh, you go up to the Madtown Throwdown, which was a Pat O'Malley show. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, that, that's usually pretty fun. Why don't you talk about that? You actually took a loss early. So, you know, they, they probably were matching you tough. Uh, why don't you talk about the competition and what you ran into in that first Madtown Throwdown? So, yeah, Nate Homie. Uh, I was pounded on him pretty good for two rounds and it was uh, just two rounds. And at the end of the second round, he caught me in a triangle and I wasn't getting out. I wasn't getting out. I, I fought and fought and uh, dropped my knee on his face a couple of times, dropped my knees on his uh, ribs a few times and just couldn't get out. And I was in it for like two minutes and ended up tapping out. Well, I physically beat him so bad that he didn't continue in the tournament. So one of the two of us had to go on. So they put me on into the finals, into the finals where I fought uh, uh, Andrew Buckland. Is it Buckland? Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, Normington, Andy Normington. Andy Normington, yeah. <laughs> uh, and he was a tough Muay Thai fighter at the time. Well, if you're going to go one and one in a tournament, that's the way to do it. You know what I mean? Get put back in and win the whole thing. <laughs> And, yeah, and that's what ended up happening. And then uh, I ended up breaking a- Andy's face. I felt bad for him, but I really didn't feel bad because this shit would have done it to me. Like, you know, he was ready to kick my head off my shoulders. And it's an MMA fight. Like, I don't, I don't maliciously mean to hurt people, but uh, I knew he didn't have jujitsu, and I knew it was going to be rudimentary. And uh, I was pissed because I lost. And... Uh, I took it out, and they they, they played the, the Japan rules in Wisconsin at the time, so you could soccer kick the face and stomp the head and all that shit. <laughs> no elbows allowed, which was great for me because I didn't like getting cut with it by the stupid elbow. Yeah. But I no, love the fact that you could – Yeah, yeah, they played, the, they played, they played, they played those, uh, those weird Japan rules. And uh, so I had side control and Andy – and I dropped two knees on his face, and it broke his orbital, and he tapped out. So I ended up, I, I ended up winning the four man tournament. A uh, lot went, like you said, went one and one. That was fun. Now let me ask you, let me ask you, you, you have your wrestling base. You mentioned McVicker, who was who was the most recognizable name for me as as like a long time jujitsu coach. By two thousand six, he was already a black belt for ages, probably. You mm-hmm. know, if I'm not mistaken. So. <laughs> Um, would you the, the Muay Thai stuff you just took right to? Is that you know, are you putting it together or were you getting guys to the ground and beating them up there? Yeah, the, the strategy wasn't, I, I was, I was, I could do striking then, but my strategy and strong points were my wrestling and my jujitsu. So stick to what we know and take and less likelihood of you know, doing you know, taking a lot of damage is on the ground. And that's the strategy for majority of fights. You know, you 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 went into it with high level people. You went into it with a good bit of confidence. It sounds like, but at what point did you realize? Look, I'm big. I'm you know, it's not like I'm getting dwarfed by 170 pounders or running into better athletes, like you said. What were you a tight end in football? Uh, strong outside linebacker. Okay, so, so I mean, you've got your athleticism. And you're big, or so because some guys find themselves like, oh, uh, fighting 20 pounds too big, you know, early on in their career. You had all that adjusted right from the beginning. Mm-hmm. When did you realize you could hang with, you know, the, at the time, maybe the Matt Hughes and, and people like that of the world? Oh, shit. Um, when 
I'm, let's see. When did I? I don't know. I, I That's a very good question. When did I realize I could hang with the big dogs? Um, I don't. So I really didn't get tested, I don't think, until. Like, I was stomping mud holes in people for a little while. Yeah. I would, looking at your career now, looking through the names and stuff, you fought on uh, the LOF, you fought Brent Weedman, who, you know, qualifies as another guy like yourself that, you know, really put in the work and got, you know, to a pretty high level. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Weedman, I think actually, I think you, you had a couple of fights with him, but this is one, you know, early on in 2006, before you were both bigger names, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that might be your first big test. I don't know. What, what do you think? Yeah, that, that was the first big test. And like you said, he, his name wasn't anywhere. I would, and I would say my name was, you know, like it, we were both kind of getting there to that cusp. And it's like, okay, it was for, for, I was just going for the hardware. I didn't care who was there. I was going to take your head off. Like I, I knew my jujitsu and my wrestling was going to take me pretty damn far. Um, because I was getting my ass kicked back in the wrestling room and the jiu-jitsu room. Right. And it was, and it was all good. So I was like, I don't care. It's like, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to, you know, come at me in any way. And boy, that, that Brent, he, that was actually, yeah, now that you think about it, uh, he, he freaking busted my ass. Like that, that first punch, I was like, oh shit. He <laughs> dropped the punch straight down the pipe on me. Um, gotcha. And just, and, uh, I want to take people back here that since we're getting to know Dan, he said, you know, he had a run there where he was stumping mud holes in people. Let me let me explain to you what that means here. So he fought <laughs> uh he fought Justin Wilcox TKO minute 20. Wayne Bogart triangle arm triangle choke 36 seconds. Max Fowler verbal submission, I guess to strikes 30 seconds. Alex Carter submission, arm triangle again, 35 seconds. You're in love with that arm triangle. Yeah, yeah, I was there. I was catching it a lot. So, and, and that's, you know, five wins in less than three minutes total ring time. And mm-hmm. then you get maybe a little bit of a, of a pickup in competition in, in hook and shoot where it looks like uh, the first time you did uh, that show, you, you had a, was it an eight-man tournament that you won? That, yeah, that was an eight-man tournament. Talk about that because this is one of those, you know, crossover moments here in Midwest history. And, you know, if you're not from the Midwest, maybe you don't care. But if you're listening to this, hopefully you do. You know, Dan mentioned Hook and Shoot's a legendary show. And here, um, you know, they have, they're in the 2007. This is March of 2007. They've already run, you know, several dozen shows. And by all accounts, this show with Dan Hornbuckle's performance was one of those things that helped them jump to another level, too. Like, they, it, they, it all came together here. And I know the promoter, you know, kind of took you under his wing. That's Jeff Osborne, who's obviously a good friend of mine. But um, so talk about the whole experience there with Jeff and then, uh, you know, running the table in that tournament. Yeah, and believe you me, that was not an easy run by any means. Uh, I, I somebody pulled out. I had a really tough. I had a really tough first draw, and he ended up backing out. And then Wayne Bogart stepped up, so I submitted him again. Um, and then I ran into Jamie Tony, that trained with Rich Franklin and those guys out of Ohio, and that was a ten minute battle because it was only like the first two rounds were two ten minute rounds or. Uh, two five-minute rounds, so only a 10-minute round between us. And if it needed to go to a third, then it did. But, uh, I mean, I definitely – I beat him both rounds, but it wasn't easy. And, like, that was – that was those were two tough fights, uh, two tough rounds. And I ended up running into Courtney Ray in the finals who knocked his guys out in, like, 10 or 20 seconds real quick. So he was only in the ring for less than a minute between his his two fights. And I was in there over freaking 13 and had a 10 minute war with Jamie Tony. So I'm like, I got to knock this motherfucker out quick before he knocks me out. And like, you have to wrestle a guy like that. So do I have enough in the gas tank to go a third time in the, in the night, you know, you know, 15 more minutes 
And I'm like, fuck yeah, I do. Like, I didn't come here for anything. And uh, I honestly went for the Bodog contract when I got an opportunity. Like, it wasn't originally me that was supposed to be in that tournament. Uh, it was another guy named Billy Stamp. Okay. And something came something came up with Billy Stamp uh, that he couldn't participate. And then Kyle Watson, he's like, hey, you know, um, here's a 170-pound tournament, eight man, three fights one night. And, you know, you get a belt. Uh, I, I don't know. I, was, I think it was like 2000 bucks or something to, like, you know, all the yeah. fights combined. No. I, 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 uh, and that then sounds about right. Three. Yeah, and then a three fight contract with Bodog. I was okay. like, you can you can keep the belt and you can keep the fucking money, man. I said I want that Bodog tournament. Like I want that contract. Like that was a big fucking show. Like Derek Noble was on it, uh, Kyle was on it, Seraphin, Jeff Seraphin got on it, and like Eve Edwards was on it. And like this was when Bodog was blowing up and everywhere and fighting down in Costa Rica and all these. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but. Uh, it's like I wanted to be a part of that. It's like that was the next big that was the big league that I was I was wanting to be a part of to test my grit. Um, so and I knew three guys were standing in my way for it. And Courtney Ray came up and I was just like, dude, I've got to ice you, bro. Like I could see the fear in that man's eyes. He wanted nothing to do with me that night. And I was on fire. Uh I ended up TKOing him. Uh there's there's nothing else like fighting three times in one night and, <laughs> and, and winning every single one of them, man. <laughs> now, there's, there's a, there's, now, Jeff feels like it was like a pro wrestling moment, too, like just in terms of, you know, the build-up, the interaction with the crowd and stuff. And, and he felt that you took to that part of it really well, too. Like, you know, mm -hmm. so this is maybe where the handler was really born, which would be the total character. Um you know, because you went out to Japan and they had your back and stuff. So you you polished your presentation. Talk about, you know, what went into, you know, before that tournament. You know, that was actually a lot of conversations with Jeff Osborne and realizing that if you put 10 fighters in the ring, you got 10 fighters. But what's going to separate you is how you can talk on the microphone, how you interact with the crowd and how you separate yourself from those 10 fighters. So you have to build a character, you, you know, you're gonna have to build uh, a face or a heel or whatever it is that some kind of stick and, and uh, deal with it or, you know, stick with it. Well, I'm a native American, like everybody talks about how they got native American blood in them. So already people relate to me and I stand out because of that, put the blonde Mohawk on and I can fight my ass off. And the way I talk on the microphone is not disrespectful but it's very respectful and empowering and people gravitated towards it and I could fight. So I just stuck with that character just being, you know, just a positive, you know, not in your face, but very intense individual when it came to fighting and that's what gravity and that's what won the crowd. And after all those conversations with Jeff, I'm like, all right, yeah, you got to stick with it. Uh, you spoke about the hook and shoot experience and, and how, you know, there's a, a unique feeling that a lot of fighters no longer will ever get a chance at having, and that's winning three fights in a night. Talk about that. What, what, you know, what, what did that mean to you? It, that winning those three fights in one night meant that I got a three fight Bodog contract. And right. at that time, that was everything that, that was validation on my career that I was meant to play in the big leagues. And that's it. I had, to go through three bodies in one night to get it. It was, it was intense. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was really, it was, it was Do you nothing remember else what, like it. The Bodog was three fights. How much was the money for, for the, the whole the whole contract and stuff? What was all that like? Oh, shit. I I think it was around I think eight thousand total, maybe. I think it was okay. like two and two, three and three, four and four. So it was like a level UFC uh, cut. Yeah, yeah. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't the greatest, but I mean, it was definitely better than the fucking three hundred dollars I was making. It was yeah, definitely no. better than the you know thousand dollars you know for showing up. You know, three and three and four and four. Um, yeah. 
No, and then and then no, the I bottom don't. line is is you get your trip to Costa Rica, which is also kind of nice in terms of like you're not you know you're not fighting in Evansville anymore. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was uh the first one I fought uh, Piotr Jakuzinski up in uh, Vancouver, right? Vancouver, yeah. I weighed in in that in that uh, mankini <laughs> up on that balcony. <laughs> that was that was a that was a good fun little experience. That was like a was that a two night event? Yeah, um, or was yeah, it three that... night? I don't know. It was like a two night event, something where you had all the fighters going there and training and the shooting. Um, we had, did that video shoot. We had all the Bodog girls putting them in the jujitsu positions. Um, on, in front of the camera in a professional way, nothing, no, no, no funny business. Sure. Then, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> it, it was, oh man, that was a great experience, like high level. Uh, and that was when I got chosen to be in those MMA magazines. Like my photo was picked to be in all those magazines worldwide mm -hmm. and got a lot of recognition for that. Um, that was that was high level stuff, you know. You fighting you fighting a guy international competition first time on the big stage. You're looking around, you know. You got uh, Eddie Alvarez fighting. You got Mark the Magic. It was it Mark Weir, uh, <clears throat> Nick Nick Thompson, um, oh, Verdum, not Verdum, but uh, the big, gosh dang, the big Russian guy. Um, Fedor. Not Fedor, but Fedor's training partner. It was Fedor's training partner. Okay, there was a lot of was, there's a lot of people on that card too. That you know, I think it was a well mixed card. I think Jack Kaczynski later fought in the UFC. Your opponent there, uh, you made short work of him. And mm -hmm. But you know, the week of being there with the photo shoots and you know the constant production around you. That is a totally new experience. That's totally different because that's not, you know, the treatment you get in the in the Midwest. And uh, like you said, you were you, you were ready to parlay that because you you were one of the guys that came out of there, you know, that later on went to Japan and things like that. A lot of people, Gegard Musasi was on that card. You know, another guy who was a Bellator mm -hmm. champion. That so was like good, good stuff. And, and you had a good performance. What do you remember about that? Were you confident with Jack Kaczynski? Were you worried? What, what were your thoughts with him? You know, I I was very confident going into that fight that I had better striking and better grappling. So it was just going to matter be a matter of not to test how tough he was, but just to – like I, I cracked him a couple times, and I know the fight before that he fought Steve Berger. I'm like, God damn, like, that's just a tough fucking fight all the way around, man. It was a tough draw. I'm like, he's a tough son of a bitch. Like, he survived Burger. So, I'm like, I'm going to have to submit him or find a soft spot on him. And luckily, I found his liver and put him away in the fucking second round. It was, you know, or third round. I don't remember. I think Jack, <laughs> Jack Kaczynski took you about two minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I know he survived. I know he survived the first round. Okay, so they may have it wrong here out on, on Sure Dog, which is not unusual. But uh, so then after that, the Bodog comes up. Now, at this point, Bodog's kind of running out of steam. You kind of find yourself, I think, back in Evansville. It's a women's tournament. You know why not headline with you? You know what I mean? It's like I think, you know what, what what was going on there. You get a rematch with Courtney Ray, a guy you beat after a long mm -hmm. fight. So did you feel like you took a little bit of a step back there towards the when Bo, you know with Bodog falling apart a little bit? Well, they ended up honoring my Bodog contract on that hook and shoot show. So okay. I didn't care personally because it was okay. one more fight off of my contract. It was all my Bodog pay. And it was against Courtney Ray, where I know I can beat him. And I don't want to say easily because he does have great knockout power. So it wasn't a a walk in the park it was just we've been there and it allowed me to there was like two fights where he fought some guy and jeff brought me down and we did like a little uh interaction you know get the yeah. crowd involved and keep the name going and um where you know i get in the ring and talk shit to him to build up part and i was like hell yeah let's do it like 
that's the entertainment part that the crowd wants to be a part of. And you build the fight up and then even more people be there. And it helps catapult you to the next level to show people that you're able to be involved in one, the crowd and two, the entertainment value. That's um, part of MMA as well. Now at this point, uh, you you know, you're not, you're going to, the Bodog thing is going to run out. And, and, and so the question was with Courtney Ray, why give him a rematch? You, you probably wouldn't have for 300 bucks, but for, you know, the 3,003, you, you were, you were good with it. Is that um, sums it up pretty fair? Yeah, that's an easy payday and okay. just take it. But there's, there's more. And like you said, it's like Bodog starting to run out. So, more that you can bring to your name to help get you to the next stage, the better off you're going to be. Now, at this point, you know, with the Bulldog performances, a hook and shoot tournament, uh, you know, TFC, which was, you know, out of Chicago, uh, you're 16 and one, if I'm not counting incorrectly here. So you've got a pretty mm -hmm. good resume heading in. Here is, you know, maybe the beginning of 2008, and and Bodog comes apart. Was UFC ever an option for you? Where 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 did you uh, you know make it to see? Because you went to Japan eventually. But was UFC ever something you thought thought about that might have a chance with you? Yeah, right after I got done with Bodog, they flew me out. You know, I flew myself out. Out. And became an alternate the first one of those seasons for the Ultimate Fighter. Okay, so you were an that, alternate. That yeah, yeah, I was an alternate. Do you remember which season? And um, it was one where it was Sarah and Matt Hughes. Okay. That. Uh, okay, I'll look it yeah, up here. But little they, Hispanic guy. Yeah. Why would they have you as an alternate? I mean, you've got. Some pretty good pedigree. You've got some real good training, like on the mic and stuff. You know, the American Indian, you know, and, and I'm I'm really sorry if that's an offense. I didn't mean it. I'm just old and used to using that. Uh, the Native American, you know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I could see the you know coming in with the headdress, like you know, almost like pro wrestling Chief J Strombo style, you know what I mean? Um, you could really right, put on a show right, and right. brace it. Why would they not why would you be just an alternate? That's something you'd have to ask them. I was really, I was really thrown back that they picked me as an alternate. They, I went out there, had a great fucking, um, I want to say interview or tryout. You know, we did the grappling part. I submitted my guy in like ten fucking seconds, and you got five minutes to grapple. So I got there, submit my guy in ten seconds or thirty seconds or some shit. And I get up, I walk right over to the table, the Dana, and I was like, see the rest when I'm in the house. And I walked off the mat. Then that put me into the striking part. And I had Alex Karalexis holding pads for me. That was freaking perfect. Then that put me into the finals for the interview in the table in the table in front of both. And it was split the two halves. You had the UFC table and you had the um, MTV table. So they're looking for the sheep and the wolves, in my humble opinion. And I knocked that out of the park because, I mean, I just, I literally was myself and did my personality. And it was great. It was awesome. I'm like, how in the hell are you going to pick me as an alternate? Like, it was a real big blow to my ego, especially, like you said, well, you know, with an awesome record like that. And I had a lot of accreditations. And I'm like, what the hell? Well, how are you going to pick me? Like, I would have been perfect for TV. And... Um, so UFC was there and then, um, how was the conversation when they said, Hey, you're an alternate. Did you just say, okay, thanks. Or did you let them know how am I at all? You know, what, what, what was that old interaction like? Um, I ended up getting a phone call for, you know, from the, uh, the, 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 the little press lady or whatever. And they were like, yeah, we're just going to go with you as an alternate. We're still going to have you ready to go. And uh, so I'm like, I was like, I'm not going to be an alternate. Like, I don't have time to sit around and wait all these weeks to get called into the house. Like, I've got fights in Canada getting lined up, lined up. Like, I have to fight. This is this is my job. This is how I'm feeding my family. I can't wait to fight. So 
you pick me, put me in the house or don't send me the contract at all. They're like, well, we can't, you know, change our minds on that, but we'll still send you the contract to keep you as an alter. I was like, send it if you want. I'm probably not going to send it, you know, fill it out and send it back, which I end up doing. But I mean, dude, that thing. Was that fucking thick? They owned you. They owned your likeness. They owned whatever. Like it. You know, it was. Was that was a crazy. turnaround at that point too? Was that something that you know you'd gotten smart enough on the business end that you you realized it could be a a, a black hole there? Um. Yes, because I being popular didn't put money on. You know, put money in the bank account. Yeah. Didn't put food on the table. So, and that's what the ultimate fighter was going to get me ultimately was popularity. And it, it already. Yeah. At that no, point, I'm, I knew. I'm, I'm looking at, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm looking at the, the Sarah versus Hughes teams or, or the guys that fought there. I think the big star coming out of that might, might've been, and I, I may be looking at the main card finals, which was Huerta and Clay Guida. But it looks like welterweights, Mac Danzig, uh, War Machine, who's in you know in jail now, Ben Saunders, you know Ben Saunders and Mac Danzig, John Colosi, uh, Jonathan Goulet. Some guys, you know, extended their careers in the UFC a little bit there, but you know nobody there jumps out at me as like so much. You know this this field is so much better than you should have been in the show, man. That's that's insane. So how do you stay motivated after that? Um, just go on another win streak or, or continue my win streak and make them feel sorry. Like, make them want me outside of the UFC. Make so much noise that they cannot refuse me anymore. Now, now at some point in the Bodog travels and things, you must have run into Shu Harada. Is that how uh, the Sengoku deals came about? Yeah, yeah, good old shoe, man. Okay, that's good. And he, yeah. he's, a, he's a guy who was a known, you know, manager for for people and getting people over to Japan. Sengoku was a pretty good show. Talk about that because I think you were on the second ever Sengoku, May eighteenth of two thousand eight. You know, this kind of looks like a setup fight because in Japan. If you don't have a Japanese opponent, you're going over there to fight another American, you know. It, it's kind of like that, maybe like on the undercard or stuff like that. But talk about the treatment and talk about taking your second loss there and then, you know, having at least a good feeling that they're bringing you back and stuff like that. So it's a little bit of a different experience. So talk about adapting mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, there was at the time there was no other American that I knew from the Midwest that had fought over there. Um, at least, obviously, like you said, it's a Sengoku too. It was it was right after Pride got bought out and Sengoku started up, and it was all the the same people who ran Pride started Sengoku. So you know, it's the new Pride that's getting started. And I fought Mike Pyle, and it was just different. It was night and the day. The Japanese people treated you like you're a samurai. They didn't care if you're on the undercard or the main event. You're a warrior to them. And that was a huge step up in competition for me. And not that I took it lightly. It was just, hey, you're in the big fucking leagues. Josh Barnett's up there. Um, Roger Gracie's on there. Uh, I, gosh dang. I mean, just name, name dropping names. Kevin Randleman was on there. I'm just yeah. like, holy shit, like, these guys, Jeff Monson, I'm like, God, dude, you're on a big fucking card, man. Like, you got to step up in, like, ability. And it was it was a big eye-opening experience. And, you know, Mike was no joke. You know, yeah. I was beating him up, standing on the feet a little bit. And um, I go to take him down, and it's, a, you know, just to score the last takedown. And the last 10 seconds, it was that short, the sword swing, like swing. And I thought that was the bell of the end of the round. So I relaxed and he slapped a triangle on me real quick. I was like, what the fuck? He's still going. And it cinched up quick and I wasn't going to tap. And then I was like, fuck this. And I tapped out with like two, three, maybe like four seconds left or some shit. And I was like, what in the fuck just happened? I mean, 
it it went from I'm not gonna say decisively winning the tapping out like why didn't you quit and it was just night and day and I'm not making an excuse because I mean he, he still beat me like, like he's a tough motherfucker. um upon review I'm like damn just a big mistake and now you know you know it is 14 hour time difference your day turns to night and nobody wants to travel overseas with you they don't have a passport. You know, nobody wants to take the time to go over there, even though it's a paid for flight and hotel and per diem. It's it's a tough one. And lesson learned. Lesson fucking learned. Okay. And that's when a how was that payday? That's when a huge a huge gear change. Uh the payday, uh not not much better. Not much better really. All right, like five grand, something like that. No. Oh, okay. uh, first fight over there. Yeah, first fight over there was not very good. Uh, it was, yeah, I, I think that one was like, I think that was like two and two. Okay. okay. Three and three, maybe tops. Okay. Because All they right. were just starting out and I was on the undercard. It, it wasn't, you know, my right. reputation was good, but then, um, but yeah, it was okay. But I, that's the secret of Japan for a lot of guys. You got to go over there, impress, and do well so that you can get other offers from there and maybe from, you know, because your first offer is, mm-hmm. unless you're a huge name, you're going over there to do charity work. And, you know, breaking through that is sometimes not easy. So how was your interaction with the Sengoku company? Because, you know, you fought a couple of times in the States and uh, they had you back. And you know it went it went better for you the second time, like you said. Lesson learned. Yeah, lesson was learned, and I knew that they were bringing me back over to feed their dog. Gono just got let go of the UFC, and he lost a split decision to uh, John Fitch, and that another really tough welterweight. And they wanted to pump Gono back up, and they knew I just lost to Mike Pyle. So they're like, let's feed Dan Hornbuckle to him, who's only got, you know, on paper, I'm decorated. But they seen that I just got submitted, and I'm, you know, meh, let's feed me to Gono. And I, after that lesson was learned, my training went into a whole new gear. I was, I don't want to say refocused, but I was re-energized, and I understood the level that I was at and where I needed to be to compete internationally and, and win. So I found, I found uh, a different Muay Thai instructor. Not that Ryan, Ryan's still my uh, Muay Thai coach to this day, but I found like Thailand Thai trainers that whoop my ass in the shape, old school Thai style, Koban, you know, uh, he was training around me, like world fucking decorated Koban was what my Muay Thai instructor for a long time. And his buddy Nilan was like, who was his main training partner is still a very good friend and training, you know, trainer of me to this day. And so my striking went to a whole new fucking stratosphere. My jujitsu, I started finding better wrestlers and going over, you know, to Indianapolis and down to St. Louis and up to Chicago and finding, you know, guys, you know, bigger pools to to get the, that next level and I was ready I found a strength and conditioning coach that put me through the ringer and my body found new levels of condition that I didn't even know was was humanly possible at the time <laughs> and now you, you just uh, let, let me ask you this you describe an interesting journey here because like you said Sengoku you went there the first time you know the UFC edge is an alternate uh, you took a, a lower payday in, in Sengoku maybe to get in the door and stuff like that. Um, but you're going to Japan. Now, you were almost on TV. The Bodog thing, you were, you know, flying into Vancouver and there for a week you know, TV shoot. It looks like you're making a lot. Now you're hiring, you know, new trainers and traveling to train and stuff like that. It must seem like you're making a lot of money to somebody. And in particular case, your family members actually – you know, I, I heard sued you some, you know, why don't you tell the story, but they thought you were making a lot of money and they wanted a little bite of it. It's what I heard. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much the way that it went. Um, 
so it came around the time of the ultimate fighter and we long story short we were marketing myself very well you know made the t-shirts made the hats made all this all this merchandise right back when merchandise wasn't even a, a big thing mm-hmm. but we made it and we being team hornbuckle my, my brothers uh, and my mom and my you know my sister like they all had a hand in it and we all kind of like invested a little bit of pieces each of us to kind of put into the the family so like when i did make it big we all feed the same machine and so all this merch obviously you know you need capital to get it going and they thought i was making all this money by selling the merch which you know i was selling the merch but i'm taking that money and putting it into my training at the time i'm rolling in a 2004 nissan sentra it's not, I'm not living a lavish life and I don't live outside my means. It's a little townhouse that I lived in with my three kids. And it's like, um, I'm not making a shit ton of money. So we had a little falling out. They're like, well, if you're not, they're like, Hey, you need to pay me money for the t-shirts. I'm like, I already paid you money for the t-shirt. So there's bickering about t-shirt merchandise, you know, who's paying what, what money. And he's like, well, then you ain't getting any more money from the t-shirt. I'm like, you're selling me motherfucker. Like you were selling me, you yeah. Without me, you have nothing, and I'm not trying to be big headed about it. But what do you have to sell, bud? Nothing. So it was just mainly me and one other brother that were bickering back and forth. And then he's like, "Well, you're not going to need any more t-shirts, blah blah blah." I'm like, "Fine, I'll just sell my own shit." So the wife and I started making our own shit, and somewhere along the lines, I got a cease and desist letter from an attorney out of California to not use the term handler and not use the term, you know, the, the marionette thing, because it was all something that he created that I was using. So it was like rights and royalties to that, that logo for my own fucking family. And this got came to me after. So I was at the ultimate fighter tryouts in Vegas. My whole family was in California. So they're all right there within, you know, with like a six, eight hour trip of each other. Where California, they were in the L.A. area having vacation together. And I was in Vegas at the time. So then I get home from the tryouts. And my mom called me. And not not a hello, not a I didn't know that they were there. The only reason I found out that my family was in California at the time was my sister called me and she was like hey i'm trying to get into shape when i go on vacation i was like okay cool you know i'll help you i'll get your nutrition plan i'll you know get you whatever stuff you need and i was like and just anytime that i help clients lose weight i always ask them you know what's your motivation to help you start losing weight like you got to keep that on the frontal lobe to keep you focused and dedicated she goes when i go to california and she stopped what she was talking about i was like oh what are you going to california for it's like well we're we're all going out there to see John. I was like, Oh, who, who's all we, well, the whole family is, I didn't know about it. I didn't get a phone call, nothing. (laughs) They didn't invite me and they didn't invite the wife. I was like, all right, Hey, you know what? No problem. I'll still help you. I love you. It's not a big deal. So I helped her lose some weight so they could go out to California and swim in the ocean, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And sue you. (laughs) And uh, well, right. So the whole point of that is like, I knew they were in California I was in the fucking tryouts. My mom. So when we got home from tryouts and my mom called me, she's like, so did you make the ultimate fighter? Not a hello. Not a, I left for California. Nothing. Just a straight up question. Did you make the ultimate fighter? I fucking hung up on her ass. <laughs> and then, then my, like, she called back, hung up on her again. Then like three minutes later, my sister calls. She's like, Dan, mom's making me call you blah blah blah. i was like sis don't get involved in all this shit i love you i'll talk to you later we got off the phone then like a week later i got the cease and desist letter from my family that's amazing these motherfuckers so you're gonna tell me and then still to this day i still tell this story and i and i talked to my sister and she just throws her hands i was like because i told her not to get involved i'm like you're gonna tell me that my family didn't have a little powwow meeting in california about what they were going to do if i would have made it into the ultimate fighter 
then they would have had all the fucking money that they could have ever have wanted out of me. Right. But right. they chose, but but they didn't. And so they came after me and it's like I didn't talk to them for probably eight years because of that shit. You patched it up. I mean, I'm glad you patched it up. How, how's the patch up go? How does that work out? Did they approach you say, look, I'm sorry? Because at this point, you know, your career and your record, you know, is is much better than the money you made for it in total, I think. You know, I think some guys, you know, I don't think you were ever overpaid. No, <laughs> there was never a point I was overpaid. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and I'm trying to be fair to everybody. You know, I don't want to put any other guys down, but I think you, 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 Almost never stopped paying dues, but your family had it a little skewed there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the the closing the closing times in Japan. Um, after I knocked out Gono, after I knocked out Thompson, after um, I was getting ready, I was getting ready to fight Takimoto for Sengoku's title, and that would have been the last fight of my Japan contract. Then we would have been fucking overpaid, bud. We were then Japan's champion um, for Sengoku and on a new contract and all that fucking Japanese money. Man, bro, we would have been yeah. shit. Shit. We would we would have been set because I the I had the Japan crowd then. I had two ma- major knockouts over big fucking names and like you know awesome knockouts. Yeah. I, I they were gonna pay me just just to show up and be in the crowd. It was fucking great. They were going to yeah. make action figures of my ass. Yeah. Now, Nick Thompson, too, at that point, was one of the guys that was riding high. He had a win over Eddie Alvarez, who went on to be right. a champion of over there in UFC and Bellator and all over the place. So, you know, talk about hanging with the big dogs. You were doing a great job here. Um, and now it happens to you again, it seems. Like, Sengoku starts to come apart. And you yeah. never quite get to that big payday you never quite get that big japanese belt and now you go back to deep in japan and deep i think is a show that operates at a smaller level than Sengoku. it's nice and they're still running you know hundreds of shows Mm -hmm. so you know it's not it's definitely a feather in your cap it's not a step back but maybe it did feel like a little bit of a step back for you talk about that experience going from Sengoku to deep yeah, Sengoku the Deep, uh, you know, it's kind of like that. Is like you said, it's it's not a step back, but it's kind of still that hometown feel. It's not the major production. I mean, they still have some good questions and they have you know good interviews and some good production, but it's not that major uh, limelight. But you know, big production, big stuff, big you know everywhere uh, feel. But it is a beautiful belt, and it is huge freaking names, and. It's like, okay, you're still fighting in Japan. Yeah, okay, pay. I mean, not the greatest, but, uh, you know, what to expect back. I mean, like you said, you know, it's a step back. And at least you get to go back and keep my name relevant in Japanese MMA. And you're in Japan fighting. Like, that's where the real set fight That's where the real warriors go to fight. And you're still relevant in it. And that in itself is a good experience. Do you still have the belt? No, I lost it to Rio Chonin. Oh, and they took the belt. So they took the belt from you. Oh, that's a thing. That's where you're like, I forgot it or I lost it. You should have kept that thing. <laughs> I should have kept that thing. Hey, we're not done. We're not done yet. I'll talk to Shoe. I'll go get that son of a bitch back. I'll <laughs> that's, go get that's, it back. That's interesting. Let's get, <laughs> let's get there here because because uh, that's one of the exciting things uh, that I felt about talking to you. We originally tried to schedule the interview and you were like, I'm, I'm fighting this weekend. And I was like, all right, let's wait till after their fight, you know? So yeah. you come back from Sengoku. Sengoku falls apart before you get uh, to the deep is when you have your Bellator run. And here's another one of those situations where, you know, you would have been a great fit for Bellator, you know, like in terms of like star power and stuff. They, you had a few things that they, had, they were a little vanilla white with, um, you know, they had no big stars in the early days, mm-hmm. you know, not that way class. And this was something where 
it really had to feel like a good fit at the beginning. So talk about going to Bellator. Yeah, they, they ran a format that I was already familiar with, and it was a tournament style. And they put together eight-man tournaments. Unfortunately, it wasn't all in one night. It was spread out over three months, which was great. And you're back in the uh, major production part of things. So you can get out there and be a personality. And that's what I was for them, was that personality that knew how to fight. And again, you know, I was able, I'm a relatable character to a lot of people because of the Native American side of things. And uh, they embraced that. So you felt comfortable there. You got, you're back in business in terms of you pick up right, you know, with fast finishes, uh, triangle choke, Kimura, a couple finishes, both about two minute mark. Steve Carl, tough guy. Uh, you know, how did you feel about the, the landscape in Bellator? Did you think that you had a, a title shot in the making? Were you, were you getting close? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I moved down to Florida and trained with American Top Team for nine months. So it was, you know, three, four months. Yeah, about five months beforehand when, I, when we were starting negotiating with them. I moved down there with Dan Lambert, and, you know, he set me up. And then I was training with American Top Team uh, leading up to that tournament, and I stayed down there the whole tournament. Okay. So, no, I, I knew I knew I was going to be the champion of that tournament. Okay. So l- let's talk about that. You, you you go in there, you you get the first two, and then you run into Ben Askren in the finals. Is yeah. that how it worked out? So yeah. talk about that experience because Ben, you know, I, I'm sure Ben didn't go out the way he wanted to, but Ben put together quite a damn good career too. So th- no shame in that, but talk about that match. Yeah, there's definitely no shame in Ben's career at all. Uh, phenomenal wrestler, and you know he he was heavier than I expected him to be, and he did a lot better job at wrestling than what we prepared for. It, it's hard to prepare for that funky style of wrestling, even though we did everything we could to prepare for it and stand up and get back up. It wasn't the same as what we prepared for. So um, he out wrestled me, he, and that's it. I still feel like, I mean, looking at his fights, I still feel like I put up one of the better fights against him ever. You know, I put him in submission trouble and knocked him out early on in the first opening round. And it, it was it's not an easy fight for him at all. And I'm I'm sure that's something that he doesn't he doesn't think about or doesn't uh, forget about. And and that's that's definitely a good way to look at it. Now is it something that the tournament ends now. Askren's out there. He beat you. Did you go back to Bellator into the next tournament? Is that how it worked back then? Yeah. So after that, after I lost, and then he goes and he beats Lyman. Then it's you know another tournament to get back to you know hunting uh, the next champion. And at the time, I had it wrote into my contract that I could still fight overseas because there was the lull between tournaments. You know, from the time I lost. To the time they started the next tournament, there was that long period of time. So I need to fight. That's what fighters need to do, especially with the money that has to, that has to get made off of it. They're not paying me in between fights. They're paying me to fight. Right. So I had it wrote, I, and, you know, I was so relevant in Japan. So I'm like, hey, I need to be able to fight overseas. They're like, all right, fine, 60-day contract. Okay, or 60-day terms on those contracts. And they, they kept uh, moving the date back. They're like, oh, it's oh, we're gonna have you fight this day, which is inside the term, so I couldn't fight. And then when the, when I didn't get any contracts or didn't get any nothing for those dates, then they pushed it back, which would have allowed me to fight over Japan. So they screwed me on fighting over there. Now, now, do and you then, think it was just circumstance, or was uh, that's more Jordan Rebney at that point? Was Rebney pulling one of his lawyer moves? Because you know what he did to Alvarez was kind of like his his fall from grace. Everybody kind of figured. Figured out at the end of the day you can't trust him, kind of thing. Is that was this your moment with him? I I I don't know if this was Rebney shit or not. I I I don't know. More I I don't want. I I can't. It's hard to say. That's fair. That's fair to say. I, I, sometimes you don't know what hit you, but at some point, um, you know, Bellator it, it didn't go quite your way here. You Brad Blackburn, super tough guy. Uh, you mm-hmm. get a win, and then. You're heading into a match with Brent Weedman, who you'd uh, beaten before in your career, and here you took a loss. So describe what went wrong for you, because I think you probably 
you know, judging from your mindset, that you'd probably be confident going into a, a match you wanted with a guy like Weedman. Well, uh, that's exactly the matchup I wanted was Weedman. And I knew I won that fight. Brent knows I won that fight. And when I get told from somebody inside his camp that said Christmas came early, you you kind you kind of shake your head like, okay. Now I, I felt like I was going to finish Brent, but he spent. Yeah, I mean he did the right things too. He ramped up his training. He found you know those next level guys to help him take to the next level with the striking, the next level with his jujitsu. You know he spent time out in California with the Diaz brothers. Like the, he did all the right things to. He knew what I was coming with, and he knew the level that I was operating at, and then I knew that he was training, you know, big spots and places too. And it's like, all right, hey, for, then it becomes who's going to give you the biggest test. Like to me now it's bring on the biggest, best, toughest guys you got. I want to be tested. I want to be pushed. I want to know that my time is worth the effort. And that's where, you know, these three round decisions start coming out. It's like, yeah, all right, finally, finally, you know, no more quick finishes. And, you know, I, I get to test this conditioning and test my skill set across the plane against another tough motherfucker. And, you know, he gave it to me and I definitely feel like I won. But, hey, you know what? You know, when he gets the nod, that's OK. You, I felt like I went out on my shield and didn't hold anything back. And you know, apparently he was a better man in the judge's eyes that night. Yeah, and, and, and that's a tough way to go out, though, at Bellator because, you know, with the UFC and Bellator at that point in their early run, you know, everybody had a lot of hope for, for Bellator going down the line. And you were about to step away from them a little bit. Uh, you fought Luis Santos there at Bellator 49, and, and I think that was your last fight for that company. Well, why did you not re-sign with them, or, or was that an option? No, I, I, I wanted out, and they screwed me over you know, going into that Luis Santos fight and, you know, gave me short notice on that fight. Like, hey, by the way, you're fighting this. I'm like, oh, yeah? Okay, thanks. Fucking jack wagons. Um, they screwed me out of, a, you know, a couple more fights over in Japan. And I wanted out. They, they, at that point, they weren't, uh, they got in a couple new people that behind the scenes, in my humble opinion, didn't know what they were doing and just was treating, you know, I, I'm not expecting the world, but I'm not one of these guys you're picking up off the streets either. Yeah. I'm one but, of the people that help help you bring the company along a little bit, you know, to a certain degree. So treat me with some respect and yeah. then don't be disrespectful and just come in here and treat me like, uh, like I'm some bum off the streets. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I think that that's where a lot of the companies go wrong where, you start getting that cookie cutter feel. If you're not the champion, uh, you know, they can only have so many stars and stuff. And I, you know, I beg to defer, especially if you got a hardworking guy, uh, you know, putting in the work and stuff. Why, you know, do stuff like that? You know, tell him you can find Japan and not do it and stuff like that. You can, it, it's unfortunate that they feel they have to manage the stuff that way because they leave a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of baggage. The other part is the reason it's disrespectful is because you're already accepting basically lower pay. You know what I mean? You're not getting frontline pay, so you're already giving them a bargain. What right. more can they ask of you? You know what I mean? So it's really right. a cold a cold shoulder that they give you there. But yeah. at this point, after the Bellator run, Deep comes along. And as you said, you still had some credibility in Japan in terms of uh, you know name recognition from the nice Sengoku run. You ended there on a two-fight win streak when they went down. So you get a title shot in deep right off the bat. Yeah. Is that how it went? So talk talk about that and, and your opponent there. Yeah, you uh Sheree. Like that was a that was a great fight. That was another decorated young man coming up, hungry. He was the champ and in Japan going for a piece of hardware. Like, why not? <laughs> for sure. Why not? Why not bring home the Japanese belt? And to be the first, you know, uh, North American to bring the belt home, oh, baby, you can't undo the first. And that's what we did. We just batched them inside of three rounds. It was good. It was really good. Did you go over there confident? Or, you know, now at this point, you know, you're a smart guy. You, you've kind of gotten 
I don't want to say a raw deal, but you've never gotten a break either. Did no. you feel like you may, might be facing a, a tall order with this fight, or did you go over there confident? I went over there confident. Um, a- after the two fights going there with against Gono and Thompson, I knew that this, there's nobody that they're going to have over there that is better than them. So, and and not saying any, not taking anything from you, yeah, like to- total badass. But is he a Gono? No. Is he a Nick Thompson? No. Okay, and that's it, fair. It, it, yeah, yeah. And you know, I seen I seen what he had. He didn't put in the work. He's not a seasoned veteran like those guys. So he has to fight me. He has to bring the fight to me. And this, is, you don't bring the fight to me right now. I'm, I was pretty pissed off. Yeah, it looks like you know you're just beating Pete Spratt too. Another one of those guys who paid a lot of dues. You know, mm-hmm. on the. Uh, on the the grind, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. so you go from there, you get back to deep, you win the belt. Now you come back to the United States, you mentioned, you know, maybe uh, you, you didn't have the, the the full pedigree. Now you're fighting Dennis Holman, who's a guy with, you know, tons of experience, like tons upon tons. So talk about that fight. Um, you know, it's so funny. I ran into Pat Militage this weekend, and he was the commentator for the uh, Cage Aggression. And he was also the commentator on that show down in uh, when I fought uh, Dennis Hallman. And he still talked about it to this day. You know, we're, we're, we're I think that when was that fight like 2012, 13? Yeah, the Dennis Hallman fight was August of 2013 at Titan Fighting Championship yeah, 20. Titan fight, yeah, two to thirty. So 10 years ago, Pat's still talking about this fight. I put, I put one of the most beautiful knees that anybody could ever put in anybody's solar plexus Ooh. and drop and drop that motherfucker in the first round. Boom, collapsed them in half. And he grabbed his balls. Oh. <laughs> He's a veteran though, you know. And uh yeah, I'm a, I'm a Dennis fan, but I could see at some point, you know, when you get on the plus side of 50 fights you know, sometimes you, you use the full gamut to get through them. You know what I mean? He's a veteran. Um, yeah, you're exactly right. He's very wily. Uh, you know, he's 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 slick on the ground. He's not really a big power puncher, but, I mean, he's a great wrestler, a great grappler. And we knew that. And I'm like, okay, you're going to thwart that. Like, I can stop that, no problem. And which I did. You know, he took me down. I escaped, got back to the feet, and dropped that knee right in his gut. I'm like, <laughs> party's over. Good night. He grabs his balls. The ref stands up, grabs my hand, point deduction all the way around. No warning, no nothing. Takes a point away from me. After I TKO'd the motherfucker, or knockout technically. Who's the ref? And I can't remember his name. One of the one of the one of those Miss uh, uh, Missouri motherfuckers. Okay. Um, and I'm like, and after that, the rest of the fight. My head was out of it. Yeah. My head was hard. out of it. When you get Pat robbed was, like that, it's tough. Pat was grabbing the monitor. He he picked the monitor up, and he's having replay. He turned it around, was bringing it up to the cage. It's like, it wasn't in the balls. It wasn't in the balls. Look at the fucking monitor. Look at this. He's duck knocked out. He's fucking knocked out. Pat Militage was pissed yeah. that they even allowed that fight to happen, to continue on after I knocked him out. Let me ask you a question. What was did Dennis avoid you afterwards? Because Dennis is one of those guys who he'll talk to you. He'll be on you. He's a he's not a bad guy, but he's gonna do everything he can in the ring to beat you. You know? Uh, did you interact with him afterwards? No, he, he they cut out. They split as soon as they could. Uh, all right, and maybe that's the right choice if they uh, if it went their way. Sometimes keeping your freaking mouth shut's the best way, <laughs> best way mm-hmm. to deal with that. So um, mm-hmm. anyway. Uh, so now you go back to deep, and you said you know Rio Chodan got you got the belt away from you and stuff. But talk about the build up for that fight. You know, talk about you know Chodan's the guy who beat Anderson Silva, and uh, you know you got to feel like this may be your highest moment that title defense. You know, I'll ask you about that again afterwards. But talk about that mm-hmm. fight with Chodan. Yeah, that's exactly it. Like I was looking for the best. And the toughest, and this is the guy that beat Anderson Silva, the last person to beat Anderson Silva. Uh, you got a tall order on your hands, and yeah. 
he, he's Japanese. They're they're built tough, and they know they're not gonna let you know they're not gonna strike me. They're going to grapple me and ju- use jujitsu, and he's got that flying scissor takedown. So what better weapon to initiate their takedown and into their grappling? Like it's so good. Like it's that that's tricky, man. Like it's so good. It's a great opportunity to test your grit especially in the MMA game where you're fighting real motherfucking Chonin, bro. Like everybody knows real Chonin. Well, I mean, by his hair, the way he does uh, Anderson Silva, he also fight tournament, fought tournaments and won. And it's like, man, this is the guy you want to fight. You got to defend your title. Again, and you know, you got to beat him because you're not going to beat him in that, that small hometown show and eke out a decision. He is the decision every time. And he managed to survive you, which, you know, they they picked you. Interestingly, though, that was his last fight, so it was kind of like a retirement fight for him. You feel like, and that's, yeah, and that's exactly how they they slated it too. It's like, hey, win, lose, or draw, he's still retiring, so he's got to retire the champion. So even if I went out there and I submitted him, somehow I feel like I was going to lose no matter what. <laughs> that belt okay. wasn't coming back to the states. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair i mean you you gotta you gotta give the promoters credit for at least being honest you know what i mean <laughs> so you come back here let, let me look at this here so that's 2013 october you took your fight there now after doing that now you've been to bellator you've been you know at least in vegas you got some of the ufc experience and, you know you kind of got over that then you went to japan you drank up the whole atmosphere there. How hard is it to get motivated to fight Dominique Steele now in, in, in NAAFS driven, uh, you know, getting up in motivation, going back to a small show. How, how did that feel? Um, I felt like I needed to redeem myself. Okay. And after Holman, after Chonin, it's like, okay, get your shit together, go back to your roots, go back to the Midwest, return to your glory and get your head back in the fucking game. Uh, so the best way to begin, you know, the way, the best way to start again is go back to the beginning. And that's what this fight was, it was, you know, a, a coming, coming home to the Midwest, you know, I'm fighting all over the fucking world, you know? Yeah. And then, and you forget where you come from sometimes. So, go back to the Midwest where it all begins and start again. Now, what went wrong? Because was it that Dominique saw you as a big star and, and just was hungrier at that point? Or why don't you describe it? Because it didn't go your way. And, it, and you know, obviously mindset, you wanted to bounce back. Yeah. Um, I have, I have to refer to that one. There was a uh, personal shit going on. And this is when, this is the time period of personal shit that started, uh, um, started happening to me, or I started making choices. Let's put it that way. I started making choices that were that wasn't uh, aligning with the the best Dan. Okay, all right, and and that comes with the whole thing of you know depression or you know maybe coming down from like the heights and stuff like that. You know now you're doing the same thing for less money. It's really hard to keep the total package together, focused. You see that, you know, across the board. If that fight didn't go your way. You fought one more time, and then it looks like right around here, uh, you, 2014, you retired. Or, you know, Roger Carroll, you fought. It didn't go your way. And it looks like you retired there. Talk about what happened with that loss with uh, Carroll at the end. Yeah, I was beating that son of a bitch's ass standing up. I was beating the brakes off of him, and uh, he took me down. I was getting ready to stand up, you know, working my regular uh, – stand up and he slaps my submission on myself, you know, head and arm and I'm looking out. And then before I know it, he's got it cinched up tighter than I can't get. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? And, uh, I, I tapped out. That it was just kind of that kind of the culmination of those. That was the, that was the four fight win streak or lose lost losing streak that it, to me, I felt like it was the karma of my life choices this is coming back to me. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to say, it, it looks like here you were kind of losing control, you know, with, 
uh, the focus, you know, like you, you like you, you got to have laser focus. If you got other stuff going on, whether it be, you know, whatever, a, a real job, like a, a real job, you know, mm -hmm. nine to five is one of those things. And then, you know, there are other worse choices you can make, you know. So if you're not dedicated 100 percent. So you retired, you took a knee at. In 2014, what was your age at that point? You're in your mid 30s there, still 35. You probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's 14, then I'm 34. Okay, so 34 years old and retired. Now, at some point in there, COVID hits, and you got, you know, maybe an extension of time, but you've made a comeback. And in 2019, actually, you took a fight at caged aggression. What was this fight about? Was this the intended comeback? Or was it just a one-time thing and you didn't realize that you'd be doing it again? Um, yeah, so in 2018, I decided to get my shit back together. And um, I started training hardcore and focused again. Okay. And I, I found pleasure in training again. I was like fuck it, let's fight. Let's find a fight. And Bob Long, who's a longtime friend of mine and training partner, and you know a lot of people, he, he, he's brought through me to uh, help train them. And I've he got me that fight again. Oh my goodness, gosh dang it! I know his name. I'm Jason Luke. Dang it all the time. Yeah, yeah, Jason Lauk. That's right. Oh. And uh, yeah, and. Is for a title. I was like, sure, why not? Like it, another piece of hardware to add to the collection. Cool. So go for it. So, cool. Yeah, Bob Long, an old time Midwest guy, bought up you know from the nineties mm -hmm. a bunch of guys in a small town in Illinois that you know you think nothing going on, and he put a couple, two, three, four guys in the UFC. So um, my hats off to Bob Long. So if you don't mind me asking, was it, you know, did you have a, a, a drinking problem or alcohol problem and maybe a divorce? Was that the personal stuff that was going on? Because just so that we can tag it as real heavy baggage, you know? Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. No, I, I definitely had a drinking problem. I used it as a coping mechanism. Um, there was a lot of adultery and then there was some criminal shit that I went through as well. And it was, it just was just a bad time period for myself that i had i had to fight through and get through so that's and, it, and it just interestingly like like a lifelong at this point martial artist you turn back to the martial arts to kind of get cleaned up and get focused again and you came back out yeah. there just with the bob long thing yeah. so now i guess that's 2019 so now right there you win it do you think you're gonna keep fighting and did COVID derail you at that point? What what was the mindset right after the Luke fight? Yeah, right after Lauk, the uh the COVID hit and Mike but so Cage Aggression was still putting fights on, but nobody was able to train. So uh, nobody around me was able to train. So how am I gonna take a fight? with no training partners i'm not gonna and i know exactly how you know when i try to half ass a fight or train for a fight and at that point like Locke was supposed to beat me in my humble opinion like they had it slated pretty much you know he's the young buck coming in and you know you got to take out a legend to put the feather in your cap and carry on with your career well i took care of that in the second round like go away you know <laughs> It is what it is. Like you, 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 you gamble and you didn't gamble on the right dog. And it's definitely all fire in you back. You know what I mean? That's right. You know, so that's that's what made that's a shame that COVID kind of hit at that point. Now mm -hmm. we're starting to get wrapping up. Maybe here we'll see how much longer we go. But you've, like we said earlier, you fought this last weekend. So talk about that. You're forty one now. Uh, 42. I'll be 43 at the end of this year. Okay, you're, you're one of those guys that I don't think conditioning is, is going to be a problem and, and, you know, your body. Did you, uh, let me ask you, did you ever suffer a big injury? Did you ever have, you know, come out of a fight with, with something serious? No, uh, knock on wood. Yeah, that that's a blessing. Never... I think you have one of those, 
you were kind of made for this kind of thing, you know? <laughs> it, yeah, be- and I, with the wrestling and the jujitsu and the striking, like my, my range, and I don't like getting hit. I, I Guys like, oh, I love getting hit. Man, I hate that shit. Like getting hit's the worst. <laughs> I love delivering it, but I hate receiving it. And I'm not afraid to get hit. But it's not like, hey, hit me. I was not like a Chris Lieben where I sit there and let you hit block fucking punches with my face. But with my grappling and my wrestling, like I can take the fight where I want to. And it's, uh, yeah, pretty lucky I'm not receiving a lot of damage and uh, injuries over the years. Now, how does it feel, you know, coming back at this age where you've got something now that you didn't before and that's all this time and experience you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's like are you trying to do it all correctly like how, how is it coming back is it is it the kind of thing where you're focused on a, a goal of returning to the big time like i i thought when i saw you coming back and, and because you know you're not going to be a star in 10 years i thought pfl would be a great fit for you maybe you go in there and steal a million dollar tournament, that'd be a nice feather in your cap, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think you'd be the right guy to do that because I wouldn't sleep on you. You know, that come, you coming back is like, there are a bunch of guys. You know Carlo Prater? Oh, yeah. All right, Carlo's been fighting this year. He fought, he went to Slovakia to fight and stuff like that. And physically, he's in great shape. You Holy physically shit. getting your stuff together in great shape. There are guys like that that find that motivation in their 40s and still have mileage left. And I think you might qualify as one of those guys. I'm, I'm rooting for you, man. I'm rooting for you. But what's the yeah. goal? What do you want? What do you want? I mean, you know, I still got gas in the tank, man. Uh, I got that fighter mentality. There's there's no quit left in me. My body's holding together. Am I going to make another run? I don't know. Don't really, and to be honest with you, like, I don't care. Like, I, I will fight anybody. I'm in the best physical shape I've ever been in. Uh, I've just got that old man mentality of, you know, the discipline, the dedication, what it takes. Um, the fire is back. I'm in the be- the best mental space that I've been. Uh, I'm making a lot better choices in my life over the last couple of years. I put the energy back into me and set into other things. And it's, I'm just in every aspect, like I'm winning life right now. And if I can, cont- and, and as long as I continue to put that same energy into my training, and my life, man, the sky's the limit. Is, hey, if I could make it to certain shows that I never fought in, that would be fucking amazing. That's a, it sounds like a reachable goal. It sounds like you got the right motivation, man. I'm, I'm really glad we checked in. It was this way that it wasn't just a total retrospective. Cause, yeah. you know, you get, you, you, I like it when you see that fire again, cause that's what it seems like. You sound, motivated again and i've talked to a lot of guys that they, when they lose a fire and it doesn't come back you know it's not the same but that's awesome that's awesome so what are you gonna do you're gonna call shoot tell him look get me over there again you know what i think i'm going to do that i think i'm going to do that I'd be like hey shoe what's this japanese mma scene looking like dude can we get the handler back over there you know how much how much is left and uh like i'm gonna let him know i'm in great shape and I know, you know, we're friends on the, on the Facebook and Instagram and stuff. So I know he sees what I'm up to. Um, yeah. I would love to fight in Japan again. You know, I've got some unfinished business over there and, you know, if there's something locally, you know, in the nation that uh, wants me to come and fight for me with them, let's go. I've, I've got at least another two years left. That's awesome to hear, man. Dan, I want to thank you a bunch for this time. I, we've eaten up, you know, a bunch of time already for you and uh, definitely great catching up. And uh, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me, Miguel. <laughs> yep. And talk soon, man. I'll, this will probably be up in a couple of weeks, but I'll keep in touch and send you links and stuff. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. See you, brother.